Hello and welcome in. When we're first learning about neural networks, one of the most important first steps is to understand summed squared error, particularly, of course, if we're using the backpropagation algorithm. This is the term that allows us to assess how the network is progressing as we do the training. So people often have important questions, such as, I'm just starting my training, here's my SSE, some squared error. Is this the right kind of value? Another one is, I've been training for a while, here's my SSE. Is this a good training for the neural network? Are we complete with the training? And even things like, here's my network architecture, what sort of SSE should I put into my code in order to be a good cutoff point to assure that I've trained the network? So this is a first in a two-part vid series. We're going to go through the mathematical formalities here. Then in the second of these vids, we're going to apply what we've just learned here into a very simple neural network, the XOR problem. So let's dive on in. Hello, my dear. One of the most important things that we can understand as we're learning about neural networks is how to use the summed squared error effectively. I'm Dr. Aliana Moren, and I've been doing research and teaching in neural networks for a little longer than a lady likes to admit in public. For the past few years, I've been teaching neural networks and artificial intelligence in Northwestern University's Master of Science in Data Science program, where we've recently put together an AI specialization. My motivation for putting together this vid is that as students begin working with neural networks and looking at their summed squared error values, they have questions about whether or not their neural networks are training correctly. Let's start by looking at neural network basics. We'll just give that a quick review. Then we'll figure out how to compute the error, and from that, we'll compute the SSE, or summed squared error, which is across all the output nodes in the neural network. We'll have a look at a couple of examples to round this out. Let's quickly do a review of what we already know about neural networks. We'll touch on the structure of a multilayer perceptron. We will take a look at the neural network notation that's relevant to this particular task, and we'll have a look at how we compute the output of a given neural network node. If you haven't already, please check out the two vids that I've already produced. One is on neural network notation, and the other is on transfer functions, and they're both really good preliminaries before we do this work. A multilayer perceptron is one of the simplest kinds of neural networks, and it's usually the starting place for our studies. It typically has at least three layers, an input layer, a middle or hidden layer, and an output layer. By way of notation, the output layer nodes, which we'll dub capital O, have subscripts or units running from 0 up through k, and we start counting Python style, so the first node is number 0. One of the most common uses for a multilayer perceptron often called MLP, is that it's a good classifier. So in this little made-up example, we're going to use a three-output node neural network, O0, O1, and O2, and we'll call the O1 node the desired classification for the particular input that you can see at the bottom. Let's briefly recall how we get the actual output, often called the activation, of one of those output nodes. First, we get the inputs into that node, and those are the sum of the weighted inputs that come into it from the nodes in the hidden layer. And then we take that value and push it through a transfer function, and then that becomes the actual output. There are a number of useful transfer functions. The two that are relevant to a network that we train with backpropagation are the sigmoid, or logistic function, and the hyperbolic tangent. We'll use a sigmoid function simply because it's easier, and we just need to have something very simple for our illustration. Just by way of having a simple example, let's take the activation of the very first node in the output layer, that would be the zeroth node. Its activation is going to be the transfer function applied to the sum of the weighted inputs from each of those nodes in the hidden layer. With this little example that we've constructed, we can see that three of the hidden layer nodes are on and one is off. That is, three are shown red and one is shown in a cool blue. So let's just approximate. Let's say that the node that is off 
has an activation of zero and the ones that are on have activations of one. This means that just for this example, the sum of the weighted inputs into that particular node are going to be the connection weights themselves. So because the hidden node values are one in the case of the on nodes, the connection weights zero, zero, meaning going from the zeroth hidden node to the zeroth output node, and then also from two, zero, and three, zero, that is that third and fourth node in the hidden layer connecting to the zeroth node, the first node in the output layer, those are all going to contribute. So we'll add all of those up. Let's further pretend that those connection weights are dominantly negative. That is, they will turn off that output node. So let's take a look at what would happen if we put a negative number into the transfer function. Let's pretend that the sum of those connection weights going into that node gives us a negative number like about minus 1.5. You can see that on the bottom of that x-axis in the uh, figure here. Now when we put that in, we're seeing that we get a smallish transfer function output. And I'm just sort of estimating it as 0 0.2. We're not trying to be precise. We're just getting a number to work with here. So we have the output at a given node. Now let's figure out how to compute the error. In this example, and again, suppose we're doing classification, we want to have that middle node be a 1, and the node on the left and the right, that's node 0 and 2, be values of 0. Since the output of that node, the one on the left, is actually a 0 0.2, according to our playful calculations, then the actual error is the desired or target value minus the actual, so it's 0 minus the 0.2, which gives us a minus 0.2 for our error for that particular node. Now that we have the error term, we can compute the squared error for that particular node, and once we get the error term for each node, we can compute the sum of the squared errors. In our example, we're going to have a sum squared error composed of three terms because we've got three output nodes. Each of those terms is going to be a squared term of the target or desired value minus the actual output of that node. So let's carry this through and get an example SSE for this particular case. The first thing that we'll do is plug in the target values into those three equations. We'll have zeros for the nodes 0 and 2, the left and right most, and we'll have a 1 for the central node. So just for fun, and to give ourselves some easy numbers, we'll pretend that the actual output at the nodes 0 and 2 are a value of 0 0.2 in each case, and that the actual output at the node uh, 1 is a value of, say, 0 0.8, then for each case, the error term is going to be either 0 0.2 or minus 0 0.2. And then you square each of those, so you're going to have 0 0.04 for each. And then we're going to add them together to get a 0 0.12. So here we are. Our total SSE is 0 0.12. We ask ourselves, is this good? Is this bad? Have we trained sufficiently or not? Typically, we're going to set a stopping criteria of less than, say, 0 0.1. What you, what you select is very much up to you, and we can discuss a few of those options for selecting a good value later. All right. With this, we now understand what it is that contributes to our SSE, or sum squared error. In the next bid, we're going to apply what we've learned to the XOR, or exclusive OR, problem, which is a classic problem in neural networks.